Hello. Hello, and welcome to City Council's budget hearings reconvened this afternoon uh, with PWSA and Alcasan. My name is Deborah Gross. I am a councilwoman for District 7, and I chair intergovernmental affairs. I'm happy to be here today, and so are my dogs. Um, so uh, with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Urbanic, who will give us a summary of, of PWSA's budget impacts. Thank you, Mr. Urbanic. Thank you, Councilwoman Gross. Uh, it's the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, the PWSA. PWSA is responsible for the provision of water for the majority of city residents, uh, the provision of sewer services for the entire city, and has been taking on more of a role in managing storm water. Um, some of the goals of the PWSA are uh, to responsibly and sustainably manage Pittsburgh's water for the next 12 years and well beyond 2030, to provide reliable uh, water, safe reliable water for 24-7, 365 to the customers, and to provide them with excellent customer service to renew and upgrade the, our drinking water, storm water, and sewer infrastructure to exceed all compliance standards, to prioritize public health and replace all lead service lines, to make water service accessible through customer assistance to uh, low income customers and continue a moratorium on winter water shutoffs, to be accountable, accessible, and fully transparent to the customers to fairly and equitably charge each customer based on their usage of the system, uh, to be a valued regional environmental steward of our most precious resource, water. Uh, Councilperson Erica Strasberger is a uh, city council representative on the PWSA board. Um, yeah, get out of that one. Next one, here we go. Uh, the budget highlights for 2022 in our document. The renegotiated cooperation agreement has changed the structure of the relationship between the city and authority and is reflected in the 22 uh, budget in a number of places. Uh, first revenue, uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority in direct costs, uh, $6,741,000, same as in 2021. In 2018, uh, and prior, this was an uncalculated yearly payment of $7.15 million. Expenditures this year, uh, the water line line item uh, has increased by 500,000 from uh, 3.6 million to 4.1 million. Uh, the sewer line item remains steady at $42,419. The PWSA also has an impact on the city's pension. Uh, both on the revenue end, we received pension aid as a result of the uh, employees and the units uh, and expenditures. The uh, and just as a reminder, since we uh, recently passed uh, uh, legislation uh, regarding removing the Social Security offset, the uh, PWSA retirees and employees uh, do not have the uh, Social Security offset except for the, uh, the, the new hires are no longer in the system, um, at least the non-unions. Uh, in the capital budget, there are four flood control projects in 2022 capital. Uh, that have a 50-50 city PWSA match, including Braywood Way stormwater improvements, 52,000 from each entity, Dragoon Way stormwater improvements, $67,500 from each entity, Haverville Street improvements, $57,500 from both the PWSA and the city, uh, and Stewart Avenue stormwater improvements, $149,700 from the city, and $149,700 from the PWSA. City of Council also approved $17.5 million in federal ARP funds, American Rescue Plan funds, to go to the uh, PWSA for lead line replacement projects. Uh, this is not reflected in the capital budget, but it is mentioned on page 10 of the printed budget in the American uh, Rescue Plan narrative of the operating. And uh, with that, that's all I have right now. I'll hand it off to uh, Jennifer Prosciutti and Will Pickering from the PWSA. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Urbanic. Uh, yes, so Jennifer and Will, could you introduce yourselves, please? Absolutely. Good afternoon, uh, Councilwoman Gross, 
Councilwoman uh, Strasburger and members of the public, I'm Will Pickering. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, and I am joined today by our Chief Operating Officer, Jen Prezuti. And our, our plan, if it was acceptable, was to walk through a, a brief presentation with some slides and then open it up to any questions you all may have for us. Yes, thank you. And let the record show we've been joined by Councilwoman Strasburger. Hi there. All right, Jen is taking the lead in managing the slides here. Uh, it, it has been a year since I appeared before city council in, in this capacity. I have been in this role as the chief executive at PWSA for um, approaching a year and a half. Uh, and just at the outset, I want to express how honored I am to lead this organization through a time that is undoubtedly full of challenges, but also opportunities and the progress that we've been able to make over the last few years in uh, challenging circumstances, aside from everything we have going on specific to PWSA. Um, I, I've just really been inspired by our ability to work together as a team. And we're gonna touch on some of the notable changes in 2022 and obviously uh, are available to go into detail on any of these items or others that we may not cover. So in terms of our vision and strategic direction, uh, we are focused on stabilizing the organization and setting forth a, a path uh, for our projects, but also the culture internally at PWSA. We are becoming a professional uh, organization with qualified staff in decision-making positions with the resources they need to deliver the, the product that our customers expect of us and that they, they really deserve. And so we've spent some time in the last few months considering our vision and strategic direction. And, and that isn't just my personal philosophy or, or even Jen's or the executive teams. We've uh, taken great length to poll anyone within the organization who is interested in weighing in. Uh, and we're excited that er early next year, we'll be able to announce a, a new vision and mission statement, much along the lines of what director Urbanic laid out in his introduction about PWSA, um, but we felt that now was an appropriate time to pull the staff and get us all on board with this cultural shift um, that we are really, we've really been undergoing for now for the last two to three years. You can go ahead to the next slide, Jen. So in terms of some uh, highlights and changes since we were last together, uh, we just recently, uh, we were actually surprised the Public Utility Commission voted to approve a month earlier than we anticipated our rate structure for both 2022 and 2023. And uh, the, that first bullet is really the most substance of change and it's uh, a different approach for how we recover costs associated with stormwater management, which is a growing area of our responsibilities at PWSA. Uh, the stormwater fee, which was approved by the Public Utility Commission, is a fee that's based upon impervious area on a property, whether it's residential or commercial. So the hard surfaces on that property will dictate how much of a fee that given customer uh, will be charged. And we'll get into some of the specifics on that, that fee amount. We have also expanded our customer assistance offerings, what we call our customer assistance programs. Now we have so many. I do want to credit Councilwoman Gross. Uh, you know, she was really instrumental during her time on the board in kickstarting our CAP program, uh, first with the winter shutoff moratorium, uh, which as for, for this year, uh, we have made the, the barrier to entry lower, which is something we're looking at across our program. So not just having options, but making those options easily available for customers and allowing them to be automatically enrolled where it makes sense. And the winter moratorium program is one where if you are already enrolled in our build discount program, which is an income-based program, we will simultaneously enroll you in the winter moratorium to again, reduce that uh, barrier to entry. We are also expanding the, what we call our cash grant. It's our, our hardship assistance program for a one-time infusion of help to get caught up with your bills. Previously, that program was only available to the combined water and sewer customers, which are about two thirds of our customers, but unfortunately previously excluded our customers in the South Hills uh, who just receive our sewer services. So now if you are a PWSA employee, 
regardless of whether you are a water and sewer or a sewer only customer, you're eligible to apply for that one-time cash assistance. Um, we have increased the amount that we're giving on a monthly basis under the build discount program. And one of the newer offerings are our flexible uh, payment arrangements. And we'll go into that a little in a little more detail. Uh, the, the flexibility was in part a reaction to the changing economic climate due to COVID-19. Uh, but we believe that these arrangements are something that are, you know, a benefit to customers who are having a difficult time staying up to date with their bills. And so it's our expectation to maintain those flexible payment arrangements and allow people who stay current to have some of their balances forgiven as they remain current. So that's what we call an arrearage forgiveness uh, program that is a new element that it is actually expanded upon in the, this most recently approved rate case. Uh, we're continuing to replace lead lines. We'll go into a little more detail there, but those efforts uh, continue. And thanks in part to federal funding and other resources, we're able to do more than we envisioned around this time last year. Our capital improvement program continues to advance. We, we have seen some unexpected delays due to the long lead times it takes to get permits approved by the state for some of these large capital projects. Uh, but we are still approaching our record level of investment on the capital improvement side this year. And we expect next year to be uh, certainly record setting in terms of the amount of construction activity that we are going to have across the city. Uh, and I touched on that last bullet at the outset, so we can go ahead to the next slide. Now, uh, you know, in, in talking about our culture and the professionalization of our workforce, a lot of that hinges on our environmental compliance and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to uh, make sure that we do not run afoul of our obligations to our regulators, of, of which we have many, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, EPA, uh, we have the Public Utility Commission, among others that have various pieces and parts of our regulatory framework. And in acknowledging some of our past failures that were due to non-compliance uh, and it, as part of settlement agreements that we have with our regulators this year, uh, I believe it was in March of this year, we hired our Chief of Environmental Compliance uh, and Ethics. And this individual is... Uh, at, at, it reports directly to me. We meet on a weekly basis and we cover all things ethics and environmental compliance. It, looking into 2022, we are providing this individual with additional resources to take care of the ongoing day-to-day -day compliance issues at our water treatment plant, things that are outside of the treatment plant itself, including our remote sites where we have tanks and chemical feed facilities, those all have specific compliance obligations, and we are beginning to get our arms around all of those and making sure that we are uh, up to date with all of our permitting, all of our reporting, and also very importantly, that our people are getting trained and that they take ownership. Environmental compliance is not just the responsibility of our chief. It is everyone's responsibility to make sure that we continue to improve and stay on the right trajectory. Um, and it, I think there's you know, also a, a recognition that environmental regulations are evolving and we want to make sure that we are in lockstep with changing regulatory environments, whether it's related to updating the lead and copper rule with drinking water quality. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, in changes to EPA and state guidance as it relates to PFAS and legacy contaminants that are in our source water. So uh, a lot of activity and a lot of prioritization placed on environmental compliance in the last year, and it's, uh, it's already bearing a lot of fruit, and we have made a lot of improvement just in a short period of time, and we expect more in the next year. Go ahead to the next slide, Jen. That one looks, there we go, lead service line replacement. Um, so last year we talked about a shift from uh, the what we call neighborhood-based individual lead service line replacement program to a water main-based program where we were replacing the water main. And then if we encountered lead on either the public or private side, we would go ahead and replace that as one single project. Uh, we did move forward with that in, uh, in, in this year, but we are also looking to bolster that neighborhood program, uh, thanks in part to additional funding from PennVest 
and uh, the very generous contribution from the city to supercharge our efforts to replace every lead line that we have remaining in our system. Uh, just a, a quick review of where things stand with respect to lead line replacement and our compliance with the lead and copper rule and treatment requirements. In April of 19, we started adding orthophosphate, which was a new additive. It's a food grade additive that many other utilities use. Uh, we added that to our treatment process and we observed the lead levels reduce greatly. In July of 2020, that marked uh, two rounds of compliance sampling that were below the EPA lead action level, which meant that we no longer had a regulatory requirement to replace lead lines. Though we kept our foot on the gas pedal and we have continued to replace lead lines, even though it is not a mandate, we have an internal goal. Uh, but through uh, the end of last week, actually, we have over 8,800 public lead lines replaced since uh, the summer of 2016. And we have also replaced uh, 5,789 to be exact private lead service lines. Uh, and we are not doing partial lead service line replacements. Not only is it a PWSA policy and has been for some time, the Public Utility Commission now prohibits it. So if there is any doubt in anyone's head when it comes to public uh, and private lead service line replacement, we are not doing partials. Uh, and if there's an instance when actually the, the private property owner does not want us to replace their lead line, uh, the Public Utility Commission has said that we cannot return them into service. So uh, we haven't thankfully had to use that pretty draconian measure, but um, that is out there and that is the, the way that the state is regulating this issue now uh, with respect to PWSA. Go on to the next slide. Uh, so, it, as I touched on, the, A the ARP funds have been uh, a welcomed boost to the neighborhood-based program. We're preparing the package now to put it out to bid for contractors. We expect that to that work to begin in March, and that's going to allow us to work at 1,400 properties. And uh, the really exciting part about this work is it's going to be somewhat nimble. We're going to focus on specific properties that, where we have a record of elevated lead levels. And we're also going to focus on areas where we believe that there will there are children present, like daycares, schools, childcare facilities, um, things along those lines, with the recognition that those are our highest risk populations when it comes to lead exposure. And if we believe that they have a lead service line, let's go ahead and jump them in line and replace those first. Um, so we are combining the ARP funds with funds that we get via PenVest. They're also uh, in large part federal funds but that funding comes from the state, whereas uh, the ARP funds came from the federal government to the city uh, to PWSA. The, the very exciting part is a big slug of this money, even on the PenBest side, is grant funding. So we're not having to take out additional debt to do this work, uh, and we are able to uh, alleviate some of the potential rate burden or we're able to uh, do additional work within our CIP using the rate dollars. So we love grant dollars. We know that there's a lot more to come along those lines uh, from the infrastructure bill. We're currently wrapping our head around what that might mean for PWSA, but you have the organization's commitment to look for every penny available of grant dollars because we really think that that's going to benefit our customers both on the productivity side of what we can do and getting all of the lead out of the system, uh, but then also turning toward other more uh, routine work like water main replacement and some of the larger projects that Jen's going to touch on in the CIP section. So uh, and this is just another slide on the customer assistance programs. I, I touched on this earlier, but um, here are just some specifics uh, about the, the different elements that are really enhancements from last year. For the most part, these programs were already in place, but we felt if we're asking more of our customers, we, we need to pay particular attention to those who are, are unable to pay. One uh, thing that isn't listed in here, in here that is new for uh, this year and will continue into next year is a dedicated team within customer service conducting outreach to enroll customers. So we're, again, we're, we're not relying on people to come to us. We're trying to meet people where they are. We're trying to educate uh, stakeholders in communities who might be able to reach customers who need help better than we can. Uh, and then we're also making uh, things like proactive outbound phone calls to customers if we're noticing either an increase in water usage uh, that they may not know about and may not be aware of some of the programs we have to reduce those costs, 
or uh, if it look if our records indicate they might be eligible for some of our other programs that are income based and they're not taking advantage of, of them, uh, they can make that help make that connection. We also have a very exciting program uh, with Duquesne Light and People's Gas where we can share customer information to cross enroll. So we know if if you're eligible for Duquesne Light's monthly discount program, you're eligible for ours. Let's again, reduce that barrier to entry and, and enroll them both in the same time. Uh, and, and that's another area that we're looking to build out in 2022. We have over 5,000 customers enrolled in our customer assistance programs, uh, which has been a, a, a 20 plus percent bump from last year. But we still believe and the data demonstrates that there are more customers that are eligible that we aren't reaching. So we're going to continue the, all of those proactive efforts. In addition to the programs we have here, the last one that I didn't touch on is uh, our lead reimbursement program. So regardless of income, if you're interested in replacing your private lead service line, at a minimum, we will reimburse you $1,000 for a private plumber to do that work. Depending on your income, you might receive a full reimbursement. So that's another opportunity for people who may not want to wait for us to reach them to replace their lead line, that they can take proactive effort, work with us and uh, find a plumber Combine that with potentially our field operations team and get that lead removed for them. Any questions about those programs, there's the URL there on the bottom and, and Dollar Energy Fund is our administrator, but uh, certainly recommend to folks to just call our main line and we can walk them through any of these. Thanks, Jen. Next slide. So uh, this is the 20, this slide demonstrates the difference between the 2021 uh, residential rates as compared to the newly approved 2022 rates. As I mentioned, uh, the new charge for 2022 and will continue uh, in, for the foreseeable future is the stormwater charge. Um, now, we what we call a typical customer is a residential customer using 3,000 gallons of water per month. And they right now are paying approximately $79. And beginning in January, uh, that will bump up to approximately $85. And that includes the stormwater fee. So that would reflect an average residential parcel. Uh, lots of numbers in here. This information is available on our website. It does not include the Alcasan charges, which we collect on Alcasan's behalf. Uh, so if these dollar numbers look smaller than you're accustomed to seeing in the bottom line of your bill, in all likelihood, it's because it, it doesn't include that Alcasan charge, which is based on your water usage. Um, and I believe they're going up next and, and they can explain their rate structure. We'll go on to the next slide um, because this is another important point when it comes to our consideration of our uh, customers who aren't able to afford the current rates. The increase from the for the average Bill discount program customer um, from 2021 to 2022 uh, is very small. So they currently pay that $41.77, uh, and this is going to change to $43.09. And that's because we are discounting the what we call the volumetric rate, which are our basic charges. And we are also discounting that stormwater fee for those customers. So uh, we really want to hold the line with those bill discount customers. As I mentioned, this is a multi-year rate proposal, the rate increases in 2023 are much smaller uh, on both the, the typical residential and the bill discount customer as it compares to 2022. Um, so we we're hoping that this kind of proposal gives some predictability, at least for two years for our customers in terms of knowing what to expect on their PWSA bills. And I think that's the end of me talking and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jen. All right, thank you, Will. And thank you, Council, for having us here today. Trying to get my mouse back where it needs to go. Um, I'd like to present to you today our preliminary 2022 operating budget. The PWSA board will vote to approve this budget on December 17th. And so when we take a look at the snapshot of our 2022 budget, I'll highlight the largest expenses in our budget. The first being that large green section, which is Alcasan, um, and Will just alluded to the fact that PWSA does bill and collect on behalf of Alcasan, and we do remit back to Alcasan 100% of what we bill. The next largest section is that debt service number. So it's that darker yellow section. Um, and we'll talk about debt service in, in future slides, but just know that debt service is a large component of our operating budget. The work that PW 
PWSA does is capital intensive. Um, and so that's what drives that number. And then the final largest section is uh, our direct operating expenses. So these are the funds that we use to operate the system. So those expenses are um, treatment chemicals, their vehicles and equipment, repairs and maintenance, materials, IT, and other operating contracts um, to keep our system in good order. And then you can see how we allocate the, the rest of the budget to the various um, different titles that we have for salaries and benefits, our inventory, things like that. But those are our three largest. And so some of the budget highlights uh, that I'd like to share with you. So we continue to strength, strengthen the financial health of the organization by diversifying our funding sources. We are addressing the legacy of disinvestment and we're doing that by um, our accelerated capital improvement program and by strengthening our operating metrics year over year. We are a PUC regulated utility. Um, and so we continue to have that positive relationship with the PUC and adhere to their reporting and their industry requirements. And then finally, we continue to meet or exceed all of our debt service coverages, which is an indicator of our financial health. We'll move next to the Capital Improvement Program. So the 2022-2026 Capital Improvement Program budget is our strategic plan to renew our water and our sewer systems. And now it also includes uh, with the stormwater fee, stormwater projects as well. So let's take a look at our five-year capital plan. So you can see um, from 2022 to 2026, the accelerated capital plan that we're setting forth, the PWSA has large capital projects in, plan, in planning and in place for the next five years. The majority of this investment focuses on those large critical components of our system, like our pump station, pump stations, our rising mains, our sewer mains, and our storage, most notably our clear well out at our water treatment plant. We have, again, we intend to fund these programs responsibly with a focus to keep rates low. We have a great partnership with Penvest, as Will alluded to. We also utilize traditional uh, borrowing uh, using revenue bonds. And we also use PAYGO to, to keep our funding diverse. PWSA continues to maintain a strong credit rating uh, with S&P as well as with Moody's. This slide shows a peer comparison um, for our debt. Um, as we mentioned in previous slides, PWSA is a capital intensive organization. And while this slide may not be an apples to apples comparison, we really did try to see how PWSA compared to a few of our peer utilities. And so you can see where PWSA kind of falls within that list of utilities. Um, we're kind of neatly towards the bottom there, um, but shows that, you know, we have that debt capacity, how we compare to other peer utilities when we talk about our debt um, and that we do have an achievable capital improvement pl program in place. And so that was a quick run through of our budget. I welcome any um, any questions or comments that council members may have, but I'd like to turn it back over to Will for any closing remarks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, no, no final remarks other than thank you for indulging us to walk through those and we're happy to answer any questions you have about PWSA. Great, Jen, if you could take down your screen, sure. here we are. I can see members now. Uh, I think we are joined by uh, Councilwoman Kale Smith, President Smith. And um, I am wondering if you could email that presentation to members. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> so <laughs> happy to see that. And I'll uh, turn it over to Councilwoman Strasberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Will and Jen, for being here. And um, I, yeah, there's so much that you're working on these days. I'm just going to ask one very probably challenging, but 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 I think helpful question for the public to understand and for council members to understand and um, and all of us really. And that is acknowledging that PWSA is playing catch up for um, decades of 
what I would characterize as disinvestment in our water infrastructure. While we were, while the, the authority is also working to anticipate future challenges um, and things like lead line replacements aren't necessarily uh, disinvestment, but sort of challenges that have become more urgent and so therefore are part of the capital improvement plans. And then on a positive note, acknowledging that there is an influx of federal funding, both currently and anticipated um, from additional, you know, as the allocations from the infrastructure bill become more apparent um, as broken down utility by utility. How, would, how can you uh, easily kind of state for the public where the money is going? Well, I'll say this way, how, how quickly you think you'll be in a position to say, we've, we're caught up on the, the, uh, the years of disinvestment, we're caught up to where we need to be, and we're, we're more just maintaining the system and um, being able to focus on improving, um, say, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the terminology exactly, but being able to anticipate handling stormwater in a different way to, you know, um, account for the changes um, that we'll experience through climate change and being able to really anticipate. I mean, we're doing that already, but we're doing that alongside of catching up from years of disinvestment. So when do you think we'll be at that based on your current plan and potentially anticipating additional funding coming in? When do you think we'll be at that point where we're really just on top of everything and looking uh, proactively into the future? Thank you, Councilwoman. That's a, a great question. Um, I'll, I'll need to pull out the crystal ball a little bit, uh, but I do think we will need a, about 10 years to catch up on really the what, what we would deem critical projects on the, the water side. So the, the slide that Jen showed that had our water reliability plan, many of those projects we've agreed to uh, with the state and their consent order mandated projects, but they're ones that we know we need to deliver in the near term to give the water system the kind of resiliency and redundancy um, because we are relying on components of this water system that are 100 plus years old, like that clear well structure that Jen mentioned. And, and that's not a facility you can just replace in kind. It's a, a delicate balancing act of uh, taking it offline. You need a, a backup system there's sort of a domino effect. Getting our arms around those projects, um, you know, I think is really going to take five to seven years. And then there are the some some other projects on the water side that, you know, when, when we think about storage tanks, when we think about our, our chemical facilities, uh, all different, you know, maybe less in your face infrastructure items, but ones where we've seen that similar level of disinvestment. I think, uh, you know, assuming that we have the capacity from the contractors that we're going to be relying on to get this done, I think we can get that done in, in the seven to 10 time period. Also, assuming the resources are there, but like you alluded to, we, we do anticipate having some help from the federal government. It's going to be very important to use the funds in these next five years in a way to show the value of that kind of investment, quite honestly. So that's why I said we're going to be aggressive in getting it and then putting it to its best use to make the case for future uh, areas of funding. Where we have a little bit of a question mark on timeline is exactly how we're going to approach stormwater in our combined sewer overflow program. So we are currently in negotiations with the Department of Justice, EPA, and DEP on exactly what our remedy will be. Alcasan, uh, after us, will get into you know, their plan for addressing CSOs that they negotiated with EPA. Um, and we are gonna go through a similar process and that consent order is gonna, going to have timelines and deliverables associated with it. Um, but a lot of the work is yet to be done on exactly where to, to begin just because it's such an immense undertaking. So uh, we have our own combined sewer overflow obligations. Uh, in addition to playing a role in what Alcasan is trying to do by regionalizing some of the sewer infrastructure. So that may, you know, on the combined sewer overflow side, that 
that may be more in the 20 to 25 year range for us to get our arms around it. And it's not necessarily just having the resources, um, but it's doing the engineering work. It's uh, again, finding the contractors to be able to do the work, uh, having the appropriate people be able to manage it. And then to a certain extent, some, you know, this infrastructure work, lead line replacements is just an example of how it can be very disruptive. Um, and so we don't necessarily want to be in every corner of the city every year uh, doing this kind of work at the same time. So that you do want to kind of phase some of this in also, so it doesn't all reach the end of its useful life in the same time period as well. You do want to, to, to bleed that in. So um, hopefully that wasn't too evasive of an answer, but I, I think the, the water side is going to be prioritized and, in about 10 years and then uh, 20 plus or so for us to really meaningfully address the combined sewer overflow issues. No, I think those are some really helpful uh, numbers to keep in mind and timeframes to keep in mind. And a couple of things you said resonated with me. One, um, the it just strikes me that, you know, the majority of people don't recognize how much of our water reliability comes in from systems and places that they just don't see every day from, you know, reservoirs, from treatment plants, from, you know, every single part working uh, in the way that it should and being, um, being uh, renovated, being upgraded in a way that offers, you know, the reliable water source that we all depend on. And shouldn't go without saying that um, PWSA, you all were able to do so offer reliable wa water in a reliable manner through a global pandemic without any major problems. And that is, um, you know, something that I don't think people recognize or would be recognized unless it had gone wrong, <laughs> unless uh, much like most, most, you know, utility and city services, unless something goes wrong, you don't pay much attention to it. And uh, so I didn't want it to go without saying that that is quite a feat and you should, something you should be proud of, something that our former board chair, um, Paul Legger was always mindful of and willing to say out loud. So I wanted to echo that. And I think that, you know, another thing that you said that resonated with me was the ability for um, contractors to be available to do this work in the time frame we're looking for. Uh, putting aside bureaucracy and permitting and state permits and all of that, we, we need to have the contractors and the talent ready to go to do this work. Even more reason why, you know, PBOSA, the city, perhaps the URA should work together to build that pipeline of workers and workforce development um, to take the burgeoning, smaller, you know, contractors that might not be ready for the big work. How do we pair them with other contractors, build their experience level, give them the projects, ensure that, you know, diverse set of um, women, minority owned um, and veteran owned contractors are, are building those skills. And so we have that greater pool of talent to pull from in the next 10 to 20 years on all of these items from stormwater to, um, you know, to um, water treatment, rip, you know, upgrades to asphalt and concrete paving. So um, I think that's going to be a critical point of, of cooperation among different entities as well. Thank you for those comments. If I might just give a shameless plug, we actually do have a workforce development manager position posted on our website, uh, <laughs> brand new for 2022 in the budget. Uh, so if there is anyone tuning in or if anyone uh, here today knows of a good candidate, we, we certainly recognize that workforce development need. And we want to think about these things now uh, as these larger projects approach. So we do have that pipeline. And something that I feel strongly about is I want our ratepayers to have an opportunity to either work at PWSA or work for a contractor doing work at PWSA. So they benefit from the investments that, that we're asking them to make by paying their rates. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. That, that was not an intentional setup, but I'm glad it worked out that way. And um, those, those wrap up my comments. So thank you. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. I don't see Councilwoman Smith still with us. Um, so she must have had to step away. Um, so um, I have a, just a few questions as well. Um, I was happy to see that you're expanding the cash assistance programs. Uh, so thank you for that, all the customer assistance programs. And it's so um, incredibly important that as we are rebuilding the system and raising rates that we adjust them to people's ability to pay. 
um, right? So it's, you know, we're not selling toothpaste here. Um, people need their water. And it's really important that we keep our, our water um, customers um, and, and keep them at the ability to pay that they can, that they can do. Um, I'm also um, happy to see that we're still making progress on the lead service lines, having lived through that um, effort to get the ability to do the full replacements and um, having to stand up with the board to refuse to do the partials. I'm curious about this PWC ruling. Does it apply only to PWSA, this ban on partials? It, it does. Um, and it, at least that is my understanding uh, as of right now. Um, so I, I, the PUC I know is looking at a utilities wide rule for replacing lead service lines. I just don't think it is um, at the final stages yet. So it could be coming for other utilities, but I can safely say the, the standard that's opposed upon us is not imposed upon other utilities. Um, yep, yeah, at least locally here in, in Western PA. Uh, I know we, we did a will of counsel recently to call on other utilities to ban parcels. And we were being you know asked to include it in an ordinance which we, where we didn't feel it belonged, but I am not recalling if our rule of counsel was actually addressed to the PUC. And if it wasn't, maybe we need to um, revisit that and um, address uh, our rule of counsel to the PUC who has the power um, to, to create that ban on partial lead line replacements uh, for every city resident impacted by no matter what water authority there or the water corporation there uh, served by. So good, good, good. Thank you for pointing that out, including that in your presentation. Um, also at the very top of the, there was a lot of great information, but back to the very top of the discussion, we talked about how there are kind of new payments with the piece, with the PWSA and city cooperative agreement. And, um, Again, this was going back pre-COVID when we did this, but if we could just kind of highlight, I can try to summarize, but I might not remember it all accurately because I don't live it every day like you all do, but that we really tried to um, make more specific the various ways that we operate together. That's what a cooperation agreement is, right? And so who's providing which thing and how much does either of the party charge for that thing? So when we're talking about pensions, when we're talking about um, stormwater obligations, replacing water lines when they're in a park or not in a park or on city property, those things hadn't been spelled out as clearly. So maybe, maybe you can kind of give us a refresh about there are monies that are exchanged back and forth and there are responsibilities that are shared back and forth. So if you could give us the kind of big hits on that, I think it would be helpful for everyone. Absolutely. You covered a lot of it, but I'll turn it over to Jen, who is monitoring that on a more daily basis. Sure. Yes, we do um, have the cooperation agreement in place now where each entity provides various services to the other entity um, for payment. Uh, payments to the city from the PWSA include things like the pension reimbursement, uh, permits and licenses. We now pay the payroll tax. Um, our fuel usage, and as well as our vehicle repair, where we also share the services of FBS uh, that the city uses for their fleet. Payments to the PWSA from the city include PWSA water charges, wastewater charges, and now stormwater charges. Um, those Alcasan charges that we collect on behalf of Alcasan, 50% of the metering costs for city facilities. And I'm happy to report that the Department of Public Works has worked very well with our folks to ensure that all of the city's uh, facilities have been metered. I think we have maybe four left um, and that we need a contractor to address for both of us. The city also pays hydrant charges within the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and the PWSA I left one out also pays PERDA charges. Um, to the city as well. And so last year's payments, um, we, we go through the effort of our Department of Finance as well as the Office of Management and Budget and the, the Department of Finance at the city um, to ensure that we have uh, both charges all lined out and then 
create an equalization payment. And so the PWSA paid the city um, over $4 million last year for, for the services rendered by the city. Um, so it, it was down a bit um, and, but it was absolutely invoiced basically, right? So yes. this is a bookkeeping. <clears throat> Yes, we each provide an invoice to the other with the appropriate backup to show the different uh, business transactions. I'll just add in that when this was first under consideration, I remember giving a quote to a media outlet and saying, you know, the swimming pools will still be filled. It's just a matter of which bill you, it will be paid for, right? Are you paying for it on your PWSA bill or are you paying for it on your city property tax bill or some other way. But then much to my chagrin, we did an open about 15 pools this year, maybe 18. And part of the reason why is that they were in such bad repair that the they were leaking water every day. Um, and so it's now, I think, important that we know that. It was painful. Um, you know, we, we were told that partly it was because we couldn't get lifeguards, but when we pressed, um, it was also because that was their significant repairs that are needed, especially in the swimming pools. But on the other hand, um, those pools had been leaking for quite some time, and we were just pouring water into the ground. So in some ways, it's better to do the bookkeeping. It's better to own up and face the things that are broken so that we can know them, we can identify them, we can discuss them, prioritize them, and, and get them fixed. So I do think in the end, um, I was deeply disappointed about the swimming pools. And ironically, it was the example that I had thought of um, to talk about several years earlier. But um, we, our goal is to get those pools reopened and not leaking. And then we won't have an outrageous PWC water bill to pay when we pay when we fill them. <laughs> so um, I'll just move on to that. I'm glad to, um, to hear about um, again the expanded expanded customer assistance programs. I'm glad to learn that the PUC is able to do bans on partial replacements, and hope that they will expand that to other water providers. Um, and I'll note that I don't think it's anything we can answer now, but when I kind of get your presentation by email, I really appreciated seeing the sizable um, bar charts of how big the capital improvement plans are annually. And I think somewhere in the back of my brain, I probably saw one of those about the 1990s and the 2000s showing how teeny tiny those bars would have been. Right. And so it, I think it would be nice to see a contrast if we're able, because those bar charts are somewhere probably, that really, again, gives us a graphic, uh, a picture of the contrast of, of that. When we say we're making up for lack of improvements and lack of maintenance and lack of replacements, um, it's really dramatic. You can see it in, in the email. And so, and also congratulations to getting to the level, because I remember the early days when there was basically no capital plan, capital improvement plan. And when I first got on the board and it was because the, my, in my opinion, the organizational chart, you know, there wasn't the capacity to manage those plans. And they had been decimated in my opinion by the privatized overseers. And I am really happy to see so much skill and capacity in the organizational chart at PWSA that you're able to execute huge repairs and replacements, which are desperately needed. So congratulations on rebuilding the organization as well. Thank you. Um, and then similarly, as we move forward with stormwater, um, I, I appreciate that you mentioned, Director, that there's really, the big question is gonna be where to begin. Again, we lived through this as an authority when we were faced with the lead crisis, knowing that we didn't, even, no one had kept records for 100 years of which houses had lead lines or didn't. And we just had to decide where to begin because you can't begin everywhere all at once. Um, and we did prioritize the low and moderate income neighborhoods 
neighborhoods with the low and moderate income neighborhoods that had a high portion of children in those neighborhoods and that had the high density of lead lines as we found them. Um, and so I'm anticipating it may not be the same rubric for stormwater, but that there should be an equity issue, you know, an equity element. Uh, I, I always kind of think of them as GIS layers so that you can kind of get to where your hot spots are. Um, but then are, you know, of course, causing the places that are causing overflow. And then and a reminder that both in the water systems and in the stormwater systems, you know, for the public, these are kind of discrete maps, right? So they're always like branches of trees, either the, the sewer lines coming to trunk lines, but similarly, the is it pressure districts in the water systems, right? And so that we get some of these up to a functional system um, to really bring down all of the runoff, all of the sinkholes, all the problems that we see. Um, and so it's a matter of kind of, we'll have to have, I think, public conversations about where, um, where to start. So, yeah. So let us know about that too, because I, I, now I understand it's a difficult, it's more difficult for us to have these conversations, but we're also dealing with the timelines with the PUC and their kind of windows of operation. So um, please keep us well informed so that we can do the kind of community conversations and engagement. But I know PwC went around the entire city during the lead line replacement um, plans. And it was incredibly helpful for, for neighbors to be able to, to have small meetings in their own neighborhoods where they could in, ask their own questions and, and feel better about knowing what was going on. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point when it comes to prioritization and one that we're looking at through our stormwater master planning process. Um, and we, we do have a community engagement component of that where we'll have neighborhood ambassadors uh, helping us identify those problem areas. And, and you're absolutely correct, Councilwoman, that we need to come up with the list of need and then overlay it uh, with that environmental justice and equity lens to make sure that we're making the, the right investments um, in the right locations first and, and then we take that priority approach. So we're certainly on the same page there. Thank you. Um, I think those are all of my questions that I don't see that we've been joined by any other members. Um, Councilman Strasburger, did you have anything additional? Not at this time, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of this budget hearing. Um, thank you all for being here and for your work. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I am going to call this meeting in recess. And I have lost the note that I was sent about uh, our next budget hearing. Is there anybody on the line who knows what that is? Yes, we're going to see uh, speak with Alkasan next. All right, we're, I'm trying to I'm trying to recess and leave for the day, but we haven't done Alcasan yet. It's a very long day budget hearings. I started at ten this morning, <laughs> so we're just going to relieve you all at PWSA. We won't actually recess. Um, that bear with us. We'll um, ask Mr. Feiner to remove you from the room. And actually, why don't we do that? Why don't we take a five minute recess, um, even though it might be dead YouTube airtime. Um, we'll take a five minute recess and that way we can um, get you all out of the webinar and get Alcasan in and then we can all turn our cameras back on. Be right back. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. So Chair of Intergovernmental Affairs for Pittsburgh City Council. And we are reconvened for our continuing budget hearings today um, with Elkasan, the Allegheny County Sanitary Authority. Um, I will uh, hand it off to Bill Arbenik, our budget director. He'll give us a summary for city council and then we'll hear from Elkasan directly. Excellent, the Allegheny County Sanitary Authority, acronym Elkasan, located along the Ohio River of Pittsburgh's north side. The Allegheny County Sanitary Authority provides wastewater treatment services to 83 communities, including the city of Pittsburgh. Alcasan's 59 acre treatment plant is one of the largest wastewater treatment facilities in the Ohio River Valley. 
uh, processing up to 250 million gallons of wastewater daily. Alcasan was created in 1946 under the Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Act and began treating wastewater in 1959. The authority is governed by a seven-member uh, board of directors, three appointed by the mayor's office in the city, three appointed by the uh, Allegheny County Chief Executive, and then there's one joint appointment. Councilman Corey O'Connor is city council's representative on the Alcasan board. Um, from budgetary impact, uh, as noted in the PWSA highlights, uh, we have the sewer expenditure uh, line item, which remains steady. Uh, Alcasan contributed two grants uh, to the city projects uh, appearing in the grants appendix of the operating budget, $411,900 to First Tee, Shenley Park Stormwater Project that has been uh, completely spent down, $352,047 to Whiteman Park. None of that grant has yet to been spent as of last month. Uh, I know uh, Alcasan is also involved in other projects related to the PWSA too, uh, within both the city and the region. That's all I have. So off to you, Deb. Thank you, Mr. Urbanic. Um, hello and welcome. We uh, will have everyone from Elkasan introduce themselves and you can start your presentation. If you've got a visual presentation, you should be able to share screen. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm Arlette Williams. I'm the executive director here. Um, I bring greetings from your council brother, who is our chairperson, that is Corey O'Connor. He would have participated. Unfortunately, his mother took a spill yesterday evening, and he is not able to sit in. I have key staff with me today. And as you requested, Madam Chair, I will permit them to introduce themselves. Joey, if you would manage the camera, beginning with Michelle. Hello, my name is Michelle Bies. I'm the Director of Environmental Compliance. I'm Kim Kennedy, Director of Engineering and Construction. I'm Julie Williams, Director of Administration. Hi, I'm Karen Fantoni. I'm the Director of Finance. Lori McKay, Manager of Accounting. Madam Chair, today we have come to share the proposed operating and capital budget for 2022. It was just recently shared with the Alcazam Board. They will be voting on it on December 9th. We are not coming to share an overview of the authority. We're not going to get into critical projects. Again, we have simply come to share the budget. Hopefully that will allow you to achieve your recess as quickly as possible. We will be pleased to come back to council and do a comprehensive update and overview because there are many things going on with the authority as we continue working through consent decree compliance and implementation of clean water program projects. With that, I will turn it over to the Director of Finance, Karen Fantoni. We will share screen and walk you through what we are proposing for 2022. Karen? Thank you, Arletta. Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting us to share with you um, our 2022 budget. We're excited about the opportunities that next year will be bringing for us. Okay, the budget process itself, when we talk about the Alcasan budget, it's a five month long process. We actually start the budget process in August. We close the August financial statements and then we start working on it in our departments. And all every department is involved in the budget process. They look at their worksheets. They look at last year's numbers where they think they're going to finish the current fiscal year. 
and then what they believe will be the best guess based on the assumptions for next year, for 2022. After they complete those instructions and those worksheets, we held three days of departmental meetings, two days on the operating side and one day on the capital side. And then once that information is all provided, I will compile all that information actually into a large budget book. That information is also going to be provided to our consulting engineers, which is Hatch. Hatch is required under our trust indenture to review not only our budgeted information, but they also provide a separate report on our insurances, on the maintenance and health of the facilities, whether or not we would be the facilities are being maintained in a manner that is described by the trust indenture. That report is the report that will go to the board in December for them to accept and to vote on the budget. One thing that we had to do this year as part of the budget was we updated our five-year rate schedule. We have done multiple multi-year rate resolutions. Uh, The last one actually concluded this year in 2021. So we went out for 2022 to 2026, which is a five-year rate resolution that was approved by the board in October. Um, And so we were able to use that information as far as our revenue structure is concerned in the 2022 budget. Where we're at now is the board has been given the budget for the review. They're currently in the process of reviewing that and getting questions addressed. We will come back to them in December 9th and ask for their approval. And once the budget is approved, we will provide copies to the trustee as is required by our trust indenture. Some highlights for the 2022 budget. Again, we have a 7% rate increase for 2022. That is in line with the rate increases we've had for the last three years. So we've had 7% for 19, 20, and 21 as well. Um, The 7% is going to be consistent with the five-year resolution. It's going to be 7% for 2022, 2023, 2024, 25, and 26. This budget will also provide an additional $13.7 million for funding for self-funded capital. What that means is included in the rate model that we we looked at when we did the rate study we are going to be required to self-fund capital. That's that's capital that's not being funded with bond proceeds to the tune of about $900 million within the next 15 years. So we do have some cash reserves set aside in our operating account. They're not really reserves, but there is cash there. But we are going to need significant cash for self-funded capital so that we can be in compliance with our clean water program. We're also very pleased to report that this budget increases our clean water assistance payments for our most vulnerable rate payers for the fourth year in a row. We're increasing that quarterly payment by $5 a quarter to $40 a quarter. That's a significant jump. It's the largest jump we've had since we started the program back in 2017. What that program does is it provides for roughly one month out of a quarter, so four months out of a year of, of um, sewer surge for those repairs that qualify under the income requirements for that program. That program is administered by the Dollar Energy Fund, um, and we're very pleased to say that we were able to increase that sub- substantially this year. The budget also improves our coverage ratios and our liquidity for our debt service, and it meets all the requirements of our trust indenture. So what are we looking at from a cash respect, cash requirement? We, operating budget went up about a million dollars from where we were last year, so 104 million. Our debt service also went up about a million dollars over where we were in 2021 to 60, almost 61 million. Capital spending is the heavy lift this year. You're going to see that went up from about 150 million to 200 and almost 208 million. And later in the presentation, Director Kennedy will talk a little bit more about some of those large capital projects. And then we already talked about those self-funding of the capital reserves of the 13.7 million, which brings us to a total cash requirement 
of about $387 million for 2022. So when we look at our revenue, what is it that we're budgeting from a revenue perspective? We're looking at about $202 million, which is up about 10 million from where we expect to end for 2021. Uh, that is about a 5% increase. And you might say, well, why are you only budgeting a 5% increase in your revenue when you're raising rates 7%? Well, the reason is, is this year and every year, pretty much, we've had decreases in consumption. Things such as water efficient toilets, showers, washing machines, dishwashers, use less water. So it's great that you're able to conserve water, but when there's less water being used, we bill less. So those charges decrease each year. So we never recognize the whole rate increase at, in any given year. Interest income um, is only budgeted at $67,000. And quite frankly, we'll be lucky to hit that. Interest rates right now are pretty much non-existent. And then our other revenue is budgeted about 271000 so when we look at our operating expenses that are budgeted, we're looking here as where we are from a functional um, category. So our interceptor systems, which is our regionalization, it's, it's the people that going out and servicing and cleaning our regionalized sewers are about $12 million. Operations and maintenance is about 26 million. And you can read through here, I don't wanna read through this for you, but as you get down here, our total of all our departments is $104 million. One thing I do want to point out is our employee benefits. We were able to recognize a decrease in our prescription drug and our, um, our health benefits by about almost 2% this year. And that is largely attributed to our wellness program. We have an outstanding wellness program, um, which has been able to save the authority quite quite a few dollars over the last three years. We're very proud of that program. All right, Joey. Okay, thank you. Um, Capital spending, we, I mentioned before that this is going to be the heavy lift for, for 2022 and really 2022 through 2036. This is where we're going to be spending a lot of our time. Director Kennedy, again, will be highlighting some of the larger of these projects. But as you can see here, there's a lot going on in the plan. Right now, we have five projects going on right now just related to plan expansion in the plan right now, all related to the clean water program. We concluded some projects this year. This is a pretty small list compared to what we expect to happen in the near term. Um, I expect by 2025, well, this list of completed projects will be much more substantial. And I'm gonna turn it over to Director Kim Kennedy for this next slide, please. Thanks, Karen. So what's interesting about the 270 or $207 million expected for 2022 is that $155 million are from the eight projects that you see uh, in this chart. So the first five are active construction projects that are ongoing at the wastewater treatment plant right now. North End Plant Expansion is in its entering its second year of construction, and it won't be done until 2025, but we estimate about $40 million of work next year alone. Same with East Headworks. That started also this year. Um, that'll be done a little sooner. I believe that's scheduled to be completed in 2023. But again, a big year next year with a $40 million anticipated spend. Our environmental compliance facility is also, the cost associated with that is also a parking garage, which will be done in the spring. And then the building for the environmental compliance facility will be bid. That project is important because it needs to be built before we can build our um, two more primary sedimentation basins because the buildings that will house the environmental compliance um, folks will need to be uh, demolished in order to build the additional primary tanks. So that's on the critical path, no doubt. 
And then the CSO bypass and disinfection, that actually is not in construction yet, but we would expect it to be bid early next year and uh, get a bunch of work done next year. And the plant electrical distribution upgrade is in process. Um, It was awarded uh, third quarter of this year and they're they're up and running. We also have a regional conveyance job that we're expecting um, just under $15 million to be spent next year for the uh, Mon um, and Sawmill Run interceptor, subaqueous. And then the last two uh, big spends, heavy spends for 2022 are the associated with the regional conveyance facilities, the tunnels that will convey the additional flow to the treatment plant. So We've got a tunnel program manager, and then just in November, we um, issued notice to proceed to the Ohio River Tunnel final design team. Those designs will take two years, uh, at least two years, if not a little bit more. And then that is also, there's a pretty heavy lift for the permitting associated with that. And we would expect that construction to start in 2025. All right, thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. So back to rates, Um, we talked about a 7% rate increase between 2021 and 2022. So what does that mean to our average rate payer? You're looking at an increase um, annually of a slightly more than $35. It's $35.60 a year or almost $3 a month. Then with the increase that we've made into the uh, Clean Water Assistance Fund, that will reduce that for those low income rate payers down to an annual impact of $15.60 because we've increased that quarterly payment by $5 or $20 a year. So last couple slides here, what I wanted to mention, we talked about credit ratings and the importance of credit ratings in the past. Um, Moody's upgraded us the last time we went out for bonds, which was back in 2020. Um, they really, they really liked the authority. We're a very strong credit. S and P updated us back in 2018 um, with a now we're stable outlook with A plus. One of the things that they talk about for our credit strengths is our consistent five strong financial statements, um, our debt service coverages. They talk about our long-term rate plan. They they really like the long-term rate plans that we have in place. Not only does it give the rate payers the opportunity to plan, but it gives the municipalities the opportunity to plan. And we're not having to come back out to the market every year with a new rate um, structure. So they really like those rate increases, which are now approved through 2026. Um, we have an experienced management team. And one of the other things that the rating agencies really liked was the flexibility that we have in our consent decree. What are some of the credit challenges facing Alkistan? Um, the consent decree that we're under is substantial, both in terms of cost and scope. There's a lot of work um, that is going to need to be done in the next 15 years. There's a lot of work that we're going to need to be able to fund and to finance. Most of that funding will become through revenue bonds. Most of that will be through debt service. Our debt ratio is already above average. And so similar to what PWSA was talking about, we're highly leveraged. We're we're very capital intensive as an organization. That's going to continue. Um, We are going to have substantial future debt required to fund capital projects. And unfortunately, that is going to be the case. Um, We do go out and we have our um, director of government relations who is looking for grants, looking for additional funding that we can do that isn't rate payer funded. But right now, Alcasan is almost 100% funded through our rate payers. We are aggressively seeking other funding streams and we will continue to do so. So that pretty much concludes my presentation. So if you have any questions, we'd be glad to um, glad to answer them. Thank you. And if you can hear my dogs barking, yeah. I apologize. And if you could take down your screen that you're sharing, then we could all see each other a little better. There we go. Thank you. I only see with us again, Councilwoman 
Strasburger, so I'll let her uh, ask any questions. Thank, Thank you, me. Madam Chair. Thank you um, to everyone from Alcasan for your presentation, for being here today, and um, the work that you do every day. Similar to PWSA, you are um, doing the work to keep our city running, keep our region running in ways that people don't normally notice or pay too much attention to until they get their monthly bill, but they're paying for services that are crucial. And were it not for you, we would um, we would not be able to, to function as a society. So thank you, um, especially during this last year in a global pandemic. I also wanted to thank you for your investment in the stormwater feature at Whiteman Park, which is in the district I represent. It is, I know the second phase is still underway, so it's yet to sort of fully real be realized in terms of a stormwater impact, but already, um, you know, it's just generating a lot of excitement and already our, you know, Pony League and, and coach pitch baseball teams are able to play there without, you know, five days after a rainstorm without it being a soggy field. And the work that was um, that was put into that and the funding that was put into that is really making a big impact for um, a critical pocket park in our district in, in Squirrel Hill. So thank you. I think, you know, a lot of a lot of utilities, a lot of um, authorities are in a similar situation where um, and I appreciate you being honest with your credit challenges because, you know, I understand there are major, major upgrades that you have to make. And um, a lot of these are you know, years or decades in the in the making. Um, do you well, I guess a couple of questions. One, do you anticipate increased rates? if you're not able to find additional sources of funding uh, beyond the, the bonds and beyond any kind of sources of funding, increase rates into the future that are commensurate with the rate increase that we're seeing this year. And two, I'm glad to see that, you know, those are being balanced both at Alcasan at the Alcasan level, but and also at the PWSA level. And I know other utilities of other sorts have these same sorts of customer uh, assistance programs. Does someone need to apply to an Alcasan customer assistance program separate from PWSA, or are they somehow coordinated? Are they coordinated at all? Is I mean, I know the bills are, are one and the same, but are they two separate programs that people have to apply for separately? We will begin with the great question that you asked at the, oh, no, yes, November this month, the November board meeting, our board of directors committed to a five-year rate structure that has established rates from January 1 of 2022 through January 1 of 2026. So those rates are known, as Karen had indicated, it not only allows residential customers, but our municipal customers to plan accordingly. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that in 2010, our projections based on consent decree compliance and implementation of what we anticipated to be the clean water program at that time. In 2010, our projection was rate increases of somewhere from 10 to 12 percent annually for decades. So we believe we have tightened the belt as much as feasible. We are seeking some of that federal money, just like everybody else. We have made a commitment that if significant funding comes to the authority and we can somehow shape what we have put in place for this next five year structure, that will be taken into consideration. But even after that, we're going to continually look to ways to do more with less, which ultimately is in the favor of the rate payer. With respect to our customer assistance program, customers need to apply. They need to apply for Alcasan's program and they need to be 
the homeowner the receiver of the bill. Thank you. And I do recall seeing the, the five-year um, rate increase um, or the, the rate uh, plan. And I also remember recall reading that in the, in the newspaper. So thank you for clarifying that and how that might be impacted by um, new or unexpected sources of funding that we hope will continue into the future. <clears throat> Uh, the, I think that's the extent of my questions. Thank you for your presentation and again for being here today. Well, thank you for the kudos on the park. That It is a very cool project. We appreciate the support and participation. Thank you. And I'll just say I hope that we can continue to work with, with you uh, through PWSA, through you know our partnership with PWSA and Alcasan and the Grow Grant Program to bring, um, well, I know that, you know, Whiteman Park is not the only recipient um, or beneficiary of the GROW grant program in the district I represent. Um, there are some other stormwater projects that I believe are recipients as well on Chatham University's campus and, and others. Um, and I, uh, you know, what I always say is I hope that we can bring a Whiteman Park to every neighborhood in the city. So um, I'll support that even if it's not in the district I, I represent. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, back to me. I don't see any members um, on the line, so um, I will just throw in a few comments, and I will um, welcome um, Director your offer to come back and drill more deeply into the infrastructure specific projects. Um, so I appreciate that, and I think I'm going to echo Councilwoman Strasburger's concern which I shared when I was on the board of PWSA when we created the customer assistance programs, we tried and were stymied to figure out a way to overlap those kinds of benefits. Um, and, and that we're, we're each paying the same vendor under separate contracts to do basically the same kinds of processing and outreach is, is really frustrating. So, that's true across the utilities, and maybe this is another area where the PUC could provide um, basically guidance or um, even conditions that would bring down the customer assistance administration um, costs so that we could devote more of the funds to actual customer assistance across a variety of utilities. So, um, we will look on our calendar and talk to President Smith about a time when it is it fits with council schedule um, to bring you back. Possibly we've done post agendas before and it's, it's probably overdue for an update. Um, Definitely. So that would be, it would be nice to make space for a robust conversation. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, is there anything else from members or from Elkasan? Happy Thanksgiving from Alcasan. Eat a lot and flush twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. That's great advice, Director. I think that is a perfect note on which to recess. Uh, so I will declare this meeting in recess. We will reconvene um, next week. And I don't have the dates of our next public hearing, our budget hearings in front of us. Uh, but for members of the public, you can find them on our city website under the city council's calendar. Thank you.